morning, Lord. All right, I'm not a joke teller, but I have to at least tell a couple. <laughs> it's kind of the rules now when you get up here. So, where do snowmen keep their money? In the snowbank. <laughs> and what did Adam say on the day before Christmas? It's Christmas, Eve. <laughs> And what goes, oh, 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 Santa walking backwards. <laughs> all, right, so the, all right, so those are almost as good as the ones Pastor tells. But, um, you know, when, whenever you're asked to come up here, Pastor leaves very big shoes to fill. So, um, you know, I, there's so many things, just there's so much going on, I feel like, in the spirit right now. And so it was really hard to to pick a thought. So we're going to go on a little journey today. <laughs> we're going to see the inner workings of my mind and how I study scripture. Um, but there's three things that I kept hearing over and over. And um, thank you, Jane, for sharing, because the first one I keep hearing is the light has come. The light has come. And that's what I wrote on the top of my page today. There isn't really a title for the sermon today, but the light has come, son of God and son of man. And the songs we sing, we sang a song last week, the light of the world given for us, the light, the light has come. We lift up our eyes, the light has come. And today the light is breaking in a stable for a throne. And if you can't tell, Chris Tomlin is my favorite Christmas album. We're going to be singing a lot of his songs. It's, it's called Adore, and it's one of my absolute favorite Christmas worship albums if you want to look it up. But I was also really struck by what Peter shared about the parable of the talents and the concept of a gift. And at Christmas, we think a lot about gifts. And so that's really been resonating with my spirit. And Peter said something that really struck me. As humans, sometimes we're not very good at receiving gifts. There's something about us that we love to give gifts, but sometimes we're not very good at receiving gifts. And, um, and I think a lot about you know, the Christmas story and why the wise men brought their gifts. And I, I think that you know, we don't live in a time in history where royalty is a thing, but when you go before royalty, the expectation is you bring a gift. And um, I think that that kind of gets lost in our culture sometime, but I always think about that with the wise men. Um, and instead of God expecting gifts from us, he gave us all the gifts. And that's just how good our God is. And the last thing that, I don't know how these are all going to go together, but we're going to figure it out. Um, so as I've been praying, I, I, you know, the, the Lord usually gives us a word for the coming year. And I feel very strongly that our word for 2021 is metamorphosis. So just pray about that. Transformation, metamorphosis. And it's, you know, Strong's G339, um, Metamorpho. I don't know how you say that in the Greek, but it's only used four times in the New Testament, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. But so, how does light, gifts, and metamorphosis fit together? Well, we're going to find out. <laughs> going to take. We're going to go all the way back to the beginning, and just like Tim says all the time, the Bible starts with "in the beginning, God." So let's go all the way back to Genesis. We're going to start in Genesis verses one through five. Genesis chapter one, verses one through five. And I did Michael a favor and preloaded all the scriptures, so it should go fairly smoothly today. You're welcome. Um, okay. So in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And for some reason, this I've just never thought about. He created heaven and earth. I guess I always thought heaven was where he was and that it always existed, but he created heaven and earth. There's a, a tie between heaven and earth. And the earth was, out, was, was, was blah, blah. the earth was without form and void, and the darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, and that it was good, and God divided the light from the, the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening, excuse me, and the morning were the first day. And I love the way the message version says this. He said, first this, God created the heavens and earth, all you see and all that you don't see. Earth was a soup of nothingness, a bottomless emptiness in an inky blackness. 
God's spirit brooded like a bird above the watery abyss. And I think that's a picture. It's, it's, a, it's a Psalm 91 picture. It's that brooding. It's, it's, this, it's the, the cherubims and the seraphims, right? Their wings that cover. That's, that's the place where God dwells. And when he dwells, he brings metamorphosis. He brings transformation, right? Because he, he brings the light. And so he, it's also interesting to me that God felt it's so important to say light is good. And when God deems something as good, that means it's who he is. Because God is good. That means God is light. We know that. God is light. And light is just referenced over and over and over and over through the Bible. And I just think it's interesting that this is the first thing that God created. Because light is truth, right? Truth absoluteness. It's light or it's not light. Darkness isn't even a thing. It's just the absence of light. God is no different today. When God sees darkness, his Holy Spirit broods over it and he speaks to it light. And that's what he's given us, that ministry of reconciliation. When we see the darkness, we speak to it and we speak light. Okay, next, God made man. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Everything. Everything. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And the Amplified, it says, let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, make man in our image according to our likeness, not physically, but a spiritual personality and moral likeness. And let them have complete authority over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the cattle, and over every, and over the entire earth, and over everything that creeps and crawls on the earth. Notice that man did not have a physical form yet. Man was still spirit. He hadn't created a body. So God, cre God established that he creates in the spirit first, and then he creates the physical form thereafter. He created man, both male and female, as a spirit in God's image. Not a reflection, but an exact replica to rule and reign on earth. We are spirits first. As human beings, we are spirit first. And then God created the physical body of living beings. He created man's body in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And this is the weirdest Christmas message you're probably ever going to hear, but we are talking about a Christmas message. Um, Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And so God created man in the spirit, and then he created a body. And by doing this, he took part of the earth and he put his breath into it. And notice that we already, I don't know how to, I don't know how, I don't know how to like articulate this, but the body, we, he took, he took us, he already created us, and it was his breath that was the essence of us and put it in a body. We were already created. This body, there was a transfer, right? There was a transfer. I don't know if that's the best way to kind of describe what I'm thinking here, but there was a transfer from God's spirit where we dwelled, where we were, and he transferred us into this physical thing. So he created this irrevocable connection between God and man and the earth. When he breathed into that dirt, right? Man cannot survive spiritually without being connected to God. And man can now not survive physically without his connection to the earth. And he created this circle, this, this irrevocable connection. I don't know how else to describe it. We need God and we need food. We need light and we need water. These are all of the things that he created in this cycle of life. I don't know how else to say it. And likewise, the earth is now irrevocably connected to man. God put the earth under our dominion under our control, and the fate of mankind, the fate of the earth, now rests in the hand of mankind. And in this one act, God set in motion one of the most powerful and impactful truths of the Christian life. Man's spirit is fully connected with God, and man's body is fully connected to the earth. Which aspect of man rules and reigns changes by which era of man we're in. 
right? Because now man is in the middle. There's God, there's man, and then there's the earth, right? And so now we're in the middle. And in the beginning, we're ruled by our spirit. We're spirit first, right? And then we rule and reign over the earth. But with one bite into an apple, everything changed. Man no longer was ruled by his spirit, but suddenly had his eyes open and was now ruled by the eyes of the flesh, right? And that changed the rules. That changed the paradigm. Now, man, instead of being spirit first and flesh second, now man became flesh first and spirit second. And it didn't take long for it to get really bad on earth. So from Genesis chapter 2 to Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, in the days of Noah, it got so bad that God repented that he ever even created man. He wanted to destroy all of his creation. He was broken hearted. But he found one man that changed everything. And it came to pass when man began to multiply on the face of the earth and the daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men, that they were fair and that they took them wives, uh, which one they chose. And so I'm going to stop for just a second. The sons of God are not humans, right? Those are the, the different versions will tell you those are the fallen angels that have come, the giants, whatever, that were created. The sons of God is not the sons of Adam and Eve. This is the sons of God that were fallen to the earth during this time. Verse 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with men, for that he also is flesh. He's ruled by his flesh. I can't, I can't watch him destroy what I have set in motion. Yet his days shall be 120 years. I gotta, I, I've got to set a limit on how long they can walk the earth because I just can't watch. The longer they live, the more they understand how things work, the more they're going to mess it up, right? There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came uh, in unto the daughters of men, that they bare children to them, and the same became mighty men which are of old, men of renown. Which those are supposedly the giants. There's not a lot of scripture that talks about this, but that's the... the, the the women, the, the daughters of Eve, right? The, the women, the human women were marrying these fallen angels and creating these giants and, and, and mixing the bloodlines. Essentially, this is what it all boils down to is there was a tainted bloodline and Satan knew exactly what he was doing with this plan, right? Satan is out to destroy God's creation because he's livid that man has dominion over something that he doesn't and he wants power and control. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. When we're left to our own devices and we are not connected in spirit and truth to God, it gets ugly pretty quick. And we've seen what humanity is capable of throughout history. It gets ugly very quick. Even with the spirit of God here and the Holy Spirit within us, it can get ugly very quickly. And it repented God that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. He can't, create, he can't destroy man without destroying everything that he put underneath man's dominion. It's connected. It's all connected. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And Nathan's talked about this a little bit before, but God found one man in all of the earth. He found one man that didn't have a tainted bloodline, who had no blood of Satan or the enemy or those fallen angels, pure. A pure bloodline from Adam and Eve. One man that he could use to change the story because God needed a pure bloodline from Adam and Eve from his breath into the human form that he created. He needed one man and now we know the rest of the story, that God opened the heavens and the floors of the earth and flooded the earth with rain and geysers for 40 days and 40 nights. Noah and his house, all that was left, Noah and his house, and uh, one pair of all of the animals, all the different kinds of animals from all of creation were in an ark built by Noah's own hands, safe and waiting for the storm to pass. And it, I don't, I mean, Noah, part of the Christmas story, Suzanne, what are you thinking? But... If it wasn't for Noah, there could have never been a Jesus. If, if, if Satan had gotten into this last bloodline, God's plan would have been foiled and it would have been over 
for all of us, for all of humanity, for all of earth, for all of God's creation, it would have been over. And that's why there's a rainbow in the sky. It's not only God's promise to never destroy man again, right? But he wiped out Satan's plan. He got rid of every one of those bloodlines that were tainted. He, he got rid of all of those fallen angels that had sort of found their way in. And he made it not possible for that to happen again. He closed the door on that. And so not only is the rainbow a symbol or a reminder of God's promise to us that he will never do that again, but it's a reminder to the enemy that your plan didn't work. Every time there's a rainbow in the sky, you failed. And, he, and God was victorious. It just takes one man to change the story. So now God is able to continue with his plan <clears throat> into the next chapter. So now we fast forward to Abraham, a childless man uh, in his, well into his years, who was chosen to be the father of many nations. And God likes the impossible, apparently, because he picked an elderly man whose wife was barren, and he said, you, I pick you to be the father of many nations. Why? Because Abraham believed him. How many people did God talk to? How many times did God look to see who will hear my voice? Who will say, go to a place I will show you? And they pack their house and their family and they go. That is so scary. Like, think about the times in our lives when something happens and we're like, what? Like, it just changes everything. Pack up your house and go. Something happens in life. We lose a job, families, whatever, divorces. I mean, something happens. It pulls a rug out from under your feet. And God says, come follow me. Let's go do something that you've never done before. Trust me. Believe me. Believe who I tell you you are. Believe who I believe me when I say I have a plan for you and I don't care what it looks like on the outside. I don't care what it looks like around us. I have a plan for you. And that God counted for righteousness because Abraham packed his house and he left. He left to a place he wasn't he didn't even know where he was going. Like I like I have a spirit, I'm a pretty adventurous person, but to sell my house and to pack a car and be like, all right, Lord, where are we going? Like I need a map, I need a, like a hotel plan, I need no restaurants and gas. Stuff. Like I am a planner, right? Oh my gosh, like I can't even imagine. But this is a man. God says, I'll, I'll use this man because he trusts me. He believes me. And so this was the first time God made a covenant. Well, technically it's the second time. When God breathed into that earth, that was a covenant. That was a covenant between God and man and the earth. But God needed a new covenant because that one didn't work. That one was broken when they were kicked out of the garden, right? So now he needs a new covenant. And Genesis 15, uh, Genesis 15, 17 through 21. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, right? God creates out of darkness because God needs a blank slate and darkness is nothingness. I just think, I find it amazing to me. It's always in darkness that God moves, always. So when, when we find ourselves in darkness, look for the light. That's just why I keep, look for the light. The light has come. The dawn is coming. Oh my gosh, I'm going to get worked up. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. Because remember, God had told Abraham to take, uh, what was it, uh, a heifer, a goat, a ram, turtle doves, and pigeons, and cut them in half and lay them down. And blood and guts, I mean, sacrifices were messy. It was messy, 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 messy. But God said, I want a mess, and I want darkness, and I'm going to come, and I'm going to come as a smoking furnace, and a burning light is light. I'm going to come as light and fire, and I'm going to make a covenant, and I'm going to pass between them, Abraham, and I'm going to swear upon myself. I'm going to make a covenant with me in your name, on your behalf. And in the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, unto thy seed... Have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river of Euphrates? Everywhere that all of these ites live, all these nations, all these great people, it's yours. I'm not even going to read it. I'm not going to try. It's yours. It's yours, Abraham, and it's all your descendants that follow. It's yours. All of it. This sealed the fate of the future generations of man. This allowed God to come in and covenant with himself on our behalf because he realized after a very short period of time, right, once time began, how big of a muck mess man had made it. It didn't take us very long to make a mess, but God said, you know what, I'm, I have a plan, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to fix it myself because I'm going to covenant with myself, right? And he knew 
when he made that covenant what the cost would be. He knew that only God was going to be able to fulfill a covenant that he made with himself. And he made it anyway. That's how much he loves man, and that's how much he loves his creation, the earth, right? So now, we fast forward, right, to Moses. As foretold by Abraham, Moses is actually part of this covenant. He says, there's going to be some bad things happen for 400 years. You're going to be in a really bad place. It's going to be really hard times for 400 years, but then I'm going to send you somebody that will deliver you out of that. So fast forward 400 years, and God sent his people a deliverer named Moses. Talked about the Red Sea, right? Moses delivered them, and they find themselves out in the wilderness. And it didn't take long for the murmuring and the complaining. Oh, God, you brought us out here to die. They were slaves. <laughs> like, we see the pyramids of Egypt. Can you imagine the toil that they endured? I mean, we, we, we know just a little bit about it. Anybody who's watched the movie The Ten Commandments, we have a little picture of what 400 years was like, and it takes them a few months, a few years in the wilderness, and they're like, you brought us out here to die, God. God parted the Red Sea. He sent them manna. He gave them water out of a rock. And they're still, they don't understand the goodness of their God. And so God had to give them the law. Right? This is where the law was born. And um, God's people were in the wilderness. They were camped around Mount Sinai. And this is where God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. This is where it all started with just ten. God said, okay, I'm going to give them ten. They can do ten. But ten wasn't enough. <laughs> they had, Moses, what about this? Moses, what about this? What about this? What, about, what do we do here? What do we do here? And there were 613 laws by the end of it. Because 10, God said, I just have 10 for you. Just 10, guys. 10. We can do 10. 613 later, right? And even the 10, man was never going to be able to fulfill. The hearts of man was inherently evil. And even with those 10, it was impossible for man to fulfill God's law. And so in Exodus um, chapter 19, verses 16 through 20, And it came to pass on the third day in the morning, this is when they're at Mount Sinai, that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voices of the trumpet exceedingly loud so that the, all the people that was, was in the camp trembled. God is scary if you don't know who he is. God has a big stick and he, 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 there's earthquakes, there's thunder and lightning. That's scary, right? If you're camping in tents and you see all of the... I mean, God is scary if you don't know his goodness. And they didn't understand his goodness. Even after all of the provision, after delivering them, after providing for them, keeping them safe, their sandals didn't wear out. There was no sick among them. They had food. They had water. But they saw the power of the holiness of God, and it, they trembled. They were scared. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mountain, and, and God said, don't, don't let them touch the mountain, Moses. They're going to die. They can't handle it. But I want them to see who I am. And Mount Sinai was all together on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire, right? God is light. God is fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. But the people, they didn't want to get close, right? And, and just a few verses before this, when, when God was saying, come on, God wants to talk to us. And they're like, no, Moses, you go. You go and you tell us what God said, and we'll do that, right? Because men thought that they could do it, right? Because we, we got it. We got it. We're good. But it was hopeless for man. As soon as God spoke the laws, it was hopeless for man. At least it seemed like it was hopeless. Those 2,000 years was darkness. There were a few men that God spoke to, but the Holy Spirit was not over the face of the earth. Men were ruled by the desires of the flesh and the laws. There were judges and laws and wars. Great kings, not great kings. But then there came the promise of a savior. Isaiah 53, 1 through 12. 2,000 years they had to wait for a savior. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. 
He hath no form nor comeliness, and when he shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgressions of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, because he hath done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he hath numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Promise of a Savior. I can't imagine what it was like in those dark days, knowing that you just can't, you can't. You want to. I mean, it sounds like Paul, right? Everything I want to do, I don't do. Everything I do, I don't want to do, right? Because we're, we're stuck in this place where this flesh doesn't want to be connected with God, right? So we fast forward 2,000 years when God approached a young virgin named Mary, Luke 1, 26 to 38. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said to her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. And he shall be great and he shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Be it unto me according to thy word. That has, ever since I first read that scripture, I just, I want that to be my answer. Every time God speaks to me, be it unto me as you have said. Nothing is impossible for our God. And when he gives you a hope, when he gives you a dream, nothing is impossible for him. Mary had to say yes. Mary had to be willing to count the cost. It was illegal, right? She could have been stoned as an unmarried woman. To her, Joseph could have cast her off. Joseph could have not... Take, you know, Joseph could have said, um, hello, we didn't, that's not my child. I mean, we see this all, the, in today's society, we, it's hard for us to, to understand the magnitude of what she said yes to. And she, she knew that if God could do this miracle, 
God could work out all the details. I don't see any hesitation in her. I don't see any fear in her. God gave Joseph a dream. She knew that if God could do, could breathe, right? Just like in, Gen- just like in Genesis, God took the earth and he breathed into it and created something new. Now, God takes a virgin who says, yes, whatever you say, do that, Lord. I believe. I am your servant. Do that and I will do. I will believe. And he breathed into her womb and created something new that had never been created before. Fully son of God, fully son of man. A new, a new race, I guess, of humanity, right? But not only did he tell Mary this, I, I just think it's, it just shows the grace of God that he gave, he gave Jesus' forerunner to her cousin so they could encourage each other, right? It was Elizabeth. So she goes to Elizabeth. And in Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 47, he doesn't ever let us go through these scary times alone. There's always someone that God gives us to connect to that can encourage us, that we can rejoice with, that can encourage our faith when everybody's like, yeah, uh-huh, we, we see you guys aren't married. We, you're, you, know, that's, you didn't just gain a few pounds there, Mary. Right? The judgment of the world, the judgment of the family, people who are like, yeah, that's not possible. She needs someone who could believe with her. And so Mary arose in those days and went, I'm going to Elizabeth. She had a miracle too. We can celebrate that God did miracles for both of us. And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste and into the city of Judea and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. It's so important that Mary heard the words of the angel from someone she knew and loved and trusted. We need people in our lives to speak by the unction of the Holy Spirit to encourage us in ways. When you read from from John, I needed that. Because I never know if this is me and my crazy like ways I think, but it's the word of the Lord. We need to be encouraged. It's those little things, and that's why assembling together is so important, but that's a bunny trail. And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leapt in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed. For there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. We need those people in our lives. Because during those times of transformation, right, of metamorphosis, of change, it's painful and it's scary. So fast forward just a few months, and God changed everything. God came to fulfill a covenant that he made with himself, with Abraham. He knew that, it ha- that that covenant had to be paid for in blood. And he knew that it had to be paid for with a spotless lamb. So he came himself. God robed himself in flesh through the mir- miraculous birth, through a girl who said, Yes, Lord, be it unto me as you have spoken. And in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, the light has come. Jesus is born. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea and into the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. The light has come. And it didn't come in pomp and circumstance. It didn't come in a palace. It didn't come with... All the wonderful, great, you know, it didn't come with the king, right? It, it, wasn't, it wasn't the way anybody would have expected. The king of kings and the lord of lords to come came in a stable. And who came to celebrate with them? Luke chapter 2, 8 through 15. Lowly shepherds. But God sent someone, right? God always sends someone to celebrate with you. 
And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Shepherds aren't really the pillars of society back in the day. This was not, you know, these weren't great, powerful people, but they were people who were out and could see the night sky and could see the signs. And lo, the angel of the Lord came unto them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. The light had come, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go even into Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. Let's go check it out. Let's go celebrate with them. God told us so that we could celebrate with them. Let's go see. And this is why we sing the songs. This is why we make such a fuss. This is why Christmas is so special and so important. Because God himself, robed in flesh, came to flip the script and take back that which was stolen. To once again allow men to be filled with the Spirit of God, to be led and connected irrevocably to the Spirit of God. This made the enemy furious, so angry that he inspired the wicked King Herod to kill an entire generation of boys throughout Bethlehem in the area. Matthew chapter 2, verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceedingly wroth and sent forth and slew all of the children that were in Bethlehem and in all of the coast there, everywhere around the area, just in case, from two years old and under. Two years old and under. That's an entire generation in this area. According to the time which he had diligently acquired of the wise men. The enemy said, kill them all. This can't happen. This cannot happen because this changes everything. The enemy knew it. But Herod was too late. Man's metamorphosis. Man's transformation. Man's new creation from being dead in sin and being led by the flesh to securing eternal life and oneness with God led by the Spirit had already begun. It began with one man, Jesus Christ. But metamorphosis or transformation is messy. It's painful. It's difficult. It's bloody. It means the old is being destroyed and it's dying and the new has to be rebuilt to rise from the rubble and the ashes. But something beautiful always comes out of metamorphosis. And isn't it amazing that the scripture that talks about metamorphosis talks about the transformation as the revealing of light. Our God is a consuming fire. Matthew 17, verse 2. Jesus, this is when Jesus took um, a few of the disciples to the Mount of Transfiguration and was transfigured before them and his face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as the light. Um, Also uh, Mark 9 verse 2. And after six days Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves and he was transfigured before them. Why? Why did Jesus need to show Peter and James and John, his transfiguration. I think he wanted them to understand what was going to happen in Acts when the Holy Spirit fell. To not be afraid when the fire comes. To, not, to understand that this is the next step. This is the next step in the evolution and in the transformation and the metamorphosis. This is your next step as my disciples. He led them up so that they would understand in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, what would happen when they were filled with the Holy Ghost, when tongues of fire came upon them. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord and in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a mighty rushing wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, And it set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. 
people around them thought these guys were crazy. What is going on? Because it doesn't look like anything else. When you are transformed, you don't fit into the old anymore. Mankind has been transformed as a new creation, no longer fit for the old, dead earth. We are fit and created for the new heaven and the new earth. Um, and so uh, in Romans, uh, our transformation is no difference. And in Romans 12, 2, I find it so interesting that the scripture says that our transformation happens in our mind, right? Our spirits are completely transformed. We are already metamorphosized into a new creation. But in order for it to work out, it has to happen in our minds. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, metamorphosized by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What did God say was good? It's the light. And Psalms 119, 105 says, The word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. John chapter 1 tells us that God is the word. The word is the source of our light. And, and it is no mistake that this is exactly how it's described in 2 Corinthians 3.18. God tries to make it as clear as possible for us. But we all, with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed. We are transformed. We are metamorphosized into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Just when Moses came down, right? Moses came down from Mount Sinai, and he didn't know. He glowed. And the people were like, whoa, Moses, put a veil over that. We don't want to see that. Put a veil over that. What is going on with you? You are different. You're not like us anymore. Put a veil over it. We are different. We have that same light. And this is exactly what 2 Corinthians is telling us. We are to shine with the glory of the Lord. This is the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is the parable of the talents, right, that Peter talked about. This is our gift, the light that dwells in us. This is the gift that Je Jesus gave us the day he was born. And without his birth, there would be no crucifixion and no resurrection. And with his entry into this world, with his victory over death, hell, and the grave, he opened the door for the final act of redemption, the new heaven and the new earth. Because remember, God does it in the spirit first, and then he does it in the physical second. When Jesus came, he redeemed and created us in the spirit, but we are still physically in these fallen bodies, in this fallen earth. So that is why our spirits cry, Come, Lord. Come, Lord. That is why all of creation... Uh, Romans 8, 19. All of creation cries out for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth, waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. The psalm said the rocks will cry out if we won't praise him. This earth wants to be renewed. Just like it has watched us be renewed, there is a new heaven and a new earth coming. So when I... Think about Christmas and the promise of the new birth of Jesus Christ. That is the same celebration we should have when every person is born again, right? It's the new life. And we are waiting expectantly for the new thing that's going to happen. God's not done on this earth. And he needs us to bring the light. He needs us to look at the darkness and hover over it and speak to it. Let there be light. God created an irrevocable connection between God and man and the earth. Man has been reborn. We are now waiting for heaven and earth to be reborn. That is why we celebrate God's victory that began the day Jesus was born. But friends, the story is not finished, and all of God's gifts are yet to be revealed. Revelation 21, 1 through 7. There is a new heaven. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. 
And God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, no crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. He that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. If there hasn't been a theme over the last couple of years, how many times have we heard that? I make all things new. Because he transforms them. He metamorphoses, metamorphosizes them. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto, the, unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of, uh, water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, Lord. Just as we are expecting, just as they were all those years, 2,000 years ago, it's been this 2,000 years. What's next, right? We're on the dawn of the third day. We're on the dawn of the next era where it's the new heaven and the new earth. We should be expectantly awaiting his return. We should be calling and crying out for, come Lord, the new heaven and the new earth. There is a metamorphosis on our horizon. We need to seek, we need to ask. And we look to the heavens and we join the earth to say, come Lord. So as we celebrate this Christmas season, we celebrate that the light has come. Yell it from the rooftops, the light has come. And when we see darkness, we bring the light. I pray that your light shines until the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen, Amen. in Jesus' name. All right. You are dismissed. Yes. It is interesting. God had to find a man yeah. that he can make a covenant with because that's the only way he had access to this mm -hmm. because he gave it to Adam mm -hmm. and he lost it. Yeah. So Abraham was the first person he found mm -hmm. that would do what he asked him to do. Yeah. When he asked him to sacrifice his only son, yes. He knew, he promised him he was going to be a father of many yeah. nations. Right. So he said, well, and when he put him on the altar, mm -hmm. he says, well, I see this. He says, where's the sacrifice? God will God provide. Will yes. Have. He will provide. produce his yes. sacrifice. Yes. He, for some way, I don't understand, he knew. God's going to ask you to do something. He works out all the details. And Abraham knew it. Whether, it didn't matter how it worked out because he knew. He trusted. He had lived it and walked it. Just like Mary. She knew. She laid down her own life according to Jewish law at that time. She said yes. I'll, she could have died. But she said yes. Otherwise God, God couldn't have worked with her. Yeah.
so come. There you go. Praise the Lord.